right? So not a lot of slides. Um, this is going to recap uh, just a briefly about the history because I like this to be more about a dialogue. Um, the original motivation for this is to actually get S3 and S4 to suspend for file systems that have been actually broken for years. Um, it might come as a surprise to some folks that uh, file system freezing is broke, but it actually is pretty broken. And it has been for years. Um, and the problem really stems from the fact that we don't have a unified way to automatically uh, freeze file systems when we're going to suspend or hibernate. Um, when you're doing a lot of I.O., what ends up happening is essentially you just get a hang. Um, and that obviously is not a, uh, a pleasant you know, experience for users uh, trying to come, com coming back from, from uh, resume. Um, these four pages, no. So um, this is an eight-year-old problem. Uh, Yuri Kusina uh, had um, basically described this issue with the K-thread freezer and the semantics that we use in the kernel about eight years ago at, a, uh, I think that was the South Korea kernel summit or something like that. Uh, I forget which one. Um, K-thread freezer uh, APIs are basically just used sloppily. Or, um, and it came out of the idea to try to help file systems uh, with the goal of making suspend much easier. Um, a while ago, maybe about like three years ago, we discussed uh, uh, some of these patches and um, a few issues came up. It's like, all right, well, C group freezing is broken. Is it still broken? Or is anyone familiar here if, if that's still the case? No, it's fixed. What did? Oh, fantastic. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's a great help. And it took how many years to get that fixed? Oh, wow, okay, look at that new file system, great. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, freezing races on Audemont, is that still an issue? Are you got folks familiar with that? No, anyone? All right, well, I guess we'll have to keep that in mind. Um, ordering changes, th this is a bit, uh, maybe more of the complex things here to, to address. And it basically implicates that um, in the future, we may need a uh, uh, graph uh, to basically uh, keep the ordering of the super blocks. Um, Alviro regretted and lamented the fact that he had actually implemented support for an IOCTL called loop change FD to in, in order for Fedora to support live installations and basically allow you to immediately jump over to the installed system. That basically b breaks the ordering, and as such, if you do suspend in that system, then it like it, this assumption that we're making when we iterate into the supers would be broken. So we have to just be aware that suspend would be broken if we freshly install that system and use that feature. I'm not sure if Fedora will move away or migrate away from that or if other distributions are supporting that feature. Just keep that in mind if we get this merged. Uh, RAID is another example where we have different devices. Maybe the ordering is not exactly the same. The concept here is essentially we want to iterate over the super blocks and the assumption is that we can iterate backwards to also do the suspend and the freeze. You know, in theory, if you, so long as that's simple, things should work. In most of the cases for users on laptops or mobile devices, that should in theory work. That's the way people are doing it. I don't think folks on RAID are actually doing suspend S3 to S4. Anyone? Yeah, that's what I suspect. So, so long as we keep this in mind, we should move forward. Long term, though, we do need a graph. If folks are inter interested in helping to implement the proper graph in C, I do have some initial code. Is it, if anyone is interested in that, because I do have some initial template code for that. I just you know haven't looked at it for a while. Uh, you are. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, just the bottom, you got to press it all the way. How's that? Just note, uh, this might have been better with the third block people in the room as well. Because Did a lot of the things you talked about, you touch on the block there, I think, which is the file systems. Well, um, the ordering is uh, s um, on the super block. So it is technically self-contained. We do have a super block for the block cache, but that's a bit different. We don't really... Um, no, we we don't deal with uh, iterating supers. We're we're only doing that. We're only supporting this when we have a backing device. Um, so it's not really. Yeah, but but it's kind of a combination of both devices and super blocks together, right? Because 
it's stuff like loopback devices and stuff like this will really like uh, really like that the combination of you, you create a dependency essentially between two. Oh, different in, in, th in that sense, yes, yes. And it is a good point that that dependency does yeah, exist in, in in complexity for topology for block devices. So, so, so in the end, I agree. We are interested in uh, in the ordering of like basically we are interested in the partial order of the super blocks so that we can bolt it from the back and choose a partial from one or from the top to and choose a partial from one by one so that we don't create deadlocks yeah because we need to choose the top first so that the b partial can underneath create the component uh, can create the io but so yeah it, it does beg the question then what the future layout for this might or should look like right so Will it try to repost my old cache? It do just does uh, things in the reverse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's basically what's 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 done. Um, but this begs like another question, right? So for now, yeah. w w if we want to, we can dedicate our time towards the future of what this should look like. But you know, I I think that um, um oh, the other thing was mentioned was we actually don't. Uh, have an, a notification to use space. This was mentioned a while ago, so it, it should be relatively simple to do that, but to let and inform applications know that we are going to do automatic suspend free, so that way they can quiet us any work. So that doesn't exist. Um, I'm not sure if that was ever added, uh, but you know we could just add that simply. And, uh, I'm not sure what user space would prefer. Um, maybe, Le is Leonard here? Maybe. Gotta talk, but um, to be informed of a I impending freeze or a freeze happening could be interesting. The service could be frozen, for example, as well. System what, could what react should, to this. What should event. we, you know, anyone have a, a current hunch on what we should do, you know, in terms of user space, you know? Yeah, so the, I, I, I don't know that I can answer that question because the general problem, certainly Windows applications have seen this is you have to give the user application a certain amount of time to quiesce, but then if they don't actually quiesce within some timeout, say 15, 30 seconds, you just simply have to go on without them. And so typically, uh, you know, the, the actual notification I don't think is hard, that's just plumbing. You know, you use, yeah, D-Bus or whatnot. My the other thing I wanna note here though is, uh, there is also network block devices that very much are a potential issue. That was actually identified eight plus years ago and everyone just sort of said, yeah, that's hard and they all backed away slowly. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is certainly hard, but I believe the notification as such is probably more of a user space problem. Like I, I guess it would be perfectly fine if if basically like the notification went on DBus or whatever, yeah where the applications can listen to this. And simply if someone like does something by ex echo suspend to some proc file, yeah, which happens to suspend and okay, that's going to happen without notification. You know? <laughs> like you, but if you, if you trigger it from your IDE yeah, or whatever, so by some tool tooling, then that should be fired up to generate the DBus notification and all the stuff, as you said, like some timeout handling and stuff like this. But I believe this honestly, I mean, it's more of a call more of a policy question and like difficult, yeah, uh, difficult like stuff communicating with the application. Yeah. So for the kernel stuff, I, I don't think we really need to implement any notifications as such. Yeah. There is possibly one added complexity and that's things like views where you have to stop the kernel bit. Yeah. yeah. Now that you mention it, uh, uh, checkpoint on start drives are uh, have been doing this for a long time, like de dealing with specific complex issues like views right now. So uh, dependencies, dep complex dependencies has been a long-term thing for different areas of the kernel. Even at build time, we have this, and this is why I had resolved um, a simple DAG at build time um, using ELF and using ELF sections. This is the whole old linker table stuff. And that basically allows you to create a DAG so that way you can then, you know, if you want to say no op on these ELF sections, for instance, and then you can just do this at link order. You just sort the link sections and then you have a DAG. 
you basically let the linker do it. But that's on the build time, you know, in linker time. This is not, you know, this is a dynamic dependency, right? So, but yeah, there's different areas of the kernel. It begs the question, what other areas of the kernel do we need a DAG for and how do we implement it? Is it possible that we could make a DAG that user space can register bits on? Says there. Like implementing directly capital graph is trivial, right? It's just like three lines of code. The question is really like what is the information and what is the dependency and what's going to be in this. Like I wouldn't say it's difficult, it's just you have to do it in a lot of time. Like thinking about all the cases, like queues properly, adding the dependency on the parties and the and the resources it assumes. And this is a skill where you know the file system it will depend on the device. The device may depend again on the file system or or we may have like file system, file system dependency. So so this is going to require a lot of research and pushing and being very difficult to properly do it. So I don't think it's complex, but it involves a lot of like <laughs> so obviously this seems like a beginning question, but when I look through XFS tests to see if we have any test scripts, I find you know a dozen examples where we have freezing, and all those freezing examples appear, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but at a high level to be, okay, we've got this XFS feature, XFS freeze, and it calls an IOPS over, tells the file system, I need to do a snapshot or, or save the state at this point, so if something bad happens, and then we shut down, and it's okay. But what I couldn't figure out, and it was really hard to figure out, is does anybody other than XFS support it? So, so basically, all the file systems, all the standard Cook device file systems support freezing. We have support for this in VFS, and for the simple file systems, what in VFS is enough. For the more advanced file systems like XFS, VXC, for GPRFS, they have their own support for freezing. So basically, I would say ev every file system now has the freezing. The thing is that, like what we test in FS test, is the freezing of the individual file system. This is more about that we need to make the kernel freeze the file system when it is about to suspend. That's what not what's not happening currently. Currently, we just freeze the file system. Like we just let the file system live. Uh, when I was just grepping the tree, right? Um, I think I found maybe overlay or I mean there were very few places. Like if you look for the word freeze it show up. So like, what's the entry point? I mean, there's an IOCL for XFS, but... Because I, I think only a few XFS supports that. So, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, many file systems support it, really. Like, like there is the IOCL is the, IOCL is the real entry point, and like, if the file system is not obliged to implement the freeze FS method, yeah, there is super block method freeze FS. But actually, a lot of file systems don't even need the freeze FS method. Yeah, they are fine without any without doing anything because, like, we have freeze super function which takes care of writing back all the data, blocking all the writes and stuff like that. So if the file system doesn't need anything else, like blocking its internal threads, possibly doing writes to the journal and stuff like that, the file system doesn't need any of this fancy stuff and the VFS does all the stuff for it. It's, it's really only for file systems that want to do something <coughs> safer than just letting the file system write it all out. Um, like, for example, uh, actually uh, committing a transaction. So in case the laptop never comes back uh, from the suspend, that data is more likely to be safe. But strictly speaking, that's not necessary. And so you can freeze, say, a VFAT file system even though it doesn't have, you know, freeze anywhere in the code, right? So with the network file systems, presumably they want to do things like return releases to actually go and take a look, or return to take a look at those network file systems. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good point because I was dealing with a server resource constraint flow control thing recently where, you know, the server's going to, 
those leases are somewhat expensive for the server to be tracking. And if we know we're about to freeze, yeah, release all the leases. Uh, it's much cleaner. But uh, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I can look. I don't think any of the network file systems go with this type of GPL. So I'll look. So for you to do this, the freeze FS super dot method is really nice. You should be doing this one. Yeah. Oh. Okay, but maybe we can return back to the paper. Well, Leonard's Leonard's here, right? <laughs> hey. So uh, one one of the things that, that we were discussing earlier, we didn't have a clear solution for, was uh, the user space notification for the fact that um, um, freezing of file systems is going to happen to allow applications uh, some time to quiesce. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that occurs to me, given that I do know that this is what I use on my laptop. So I, I have a, a hacky uh, RTC timer thing to do uh, hybrid suspend, which basically it suspends to RAM for a bit. And then after five minutes, it detects that it, if, if it's still suspended, then it goes into hibernation. Uh, so the question would be, would that be a, a good method here? So that way we actually don't suspend to RAM using the RTC timer to allow applications to quiesce after, I don't know, three minutes or user configurable setting, then we do the issue, the, the suspend. So then user space gets at least a notification, but the question would be what notification should we send to user space? Or, or how? So actually we, we have a lot of infrastructure for things like that. Like before we go to suspend, like people can uh, like in user space allocate something like a, how do you call that? Like a um, that blocks basically suspend until they finish, and it comes with a timeout. So if they don't finish by some time, we go to suspend anyway. But that's entirely user space concept. Um, also, the the thing that you were just describing, the hybrid, like the, the you, you call that suspend uh, to hibernate. Um, no, suspend then hibernate. Um, that is actually implemented. Uh, also, like System D has has logic for that, and it can actually look at the battery and make different decisions. Um, but uh, I mean, we never call the freeze in user space directly, right? Um. That that's the thing. So, like, what what, given that, let's say, user or user space defines that they do want to go into S three or S four, um, the kernel will do some work uh, prior to doing that to uh, freeze the file system. So that way, you know, no, we stop I O in path. But it was requested, you know, maybe years ago, uh, that prior to doing that, it might make sense to notify user space that this is a event is about to happen to allow gracefully applications to also try to like slow down a bit or do something. Oh, it is. Okay. So problem's taken care of then. Well, I mean, it's, it's uh, taken care of if applications actually want these notifications, of course, but we have these notifications that they, they get notifications early. We are going to go to into suspend um, and then they can either do something or not. Um, and if they ask nicely, they get a couple of seconds time uh, before we'll continue. And then they have to report back to us um, that they do this. Um, th by the way, regarding freezing, like something that we um, are thinking about, which might maybe be relevant in this context is, um, so we currently have this problem when we implemented this thing that you mentioned with the um, suspend and hibernate, that uh, when we come back from a from a suspend and then decide to go back to an hibernate, all of the user space starts running again, right? Like for a brief moment of time. That's just stupid, right? Like because it's not supposed, like we're, we're still in the sleep conceptually, except that we are not. So uh, um, what we, like we want to use a secret freezer for this actually, so that we can basically freeze all of user space, um, um, like most of the secret free basically, except for this little thing that actually is the one that checks what the battery status is um, and, and things like that, and then goes either back to suspend or to hibernate. Um, is that any s somehow relevant? Like this thing is probably gonna be like a thin process um, that is supposed to run with very little resources. Um, and it's supposed to be like the only user space process in that moment uh, that's actually running. So I believe from kernel point of view and from the file systems we are discussing here, we have to unfreeze anyway, right? Because your process will will possibly need to access the file system and stuff like that. So yeah, we are discussing this actually that we need to freeze file systems before suspending so that the on disk state is actually consistent because like that provides better behavior when, when actually when you decide to power off the machine instead of like actually resuming or stuff like that. 
so so yeah, we so from kernel point of view, I don't think actually there will be different at least from the file system side. You need to unfreeze the file systems for your application to be able to check the battery on the side, and, and then you can freeze them again when I going to hibernate. Some people suggested that this binary we shouldn't run of the root file system, but um, run it of the memory C or something like this. I never wanted to do this, but um, if you're basically just telling me now that I don't have to, then I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess you don't have to. Uh, like we could make it work even without me. I think it will be even sim simpler for us. Yeah, it would be much simpler for me too because uh, doing that would mean we would have to compile static binaries and shit, and I'd yeah. rather not do that. All right, now it seems like uh, user space seems to be almost solved. Uh, so I guess now just review the patches. Um, I Chinner just provided one comment. I, I don't think it's a blocker. I think there's a way to out. Uh, just review your patches if you think that this is useful or important. Um, other than that, what I really wanted to talk about was What's next? Uh, it seems like you know after eight years we we probably might be merging some of this stuff soon. It begs the question what to do for the other subsystem. Remember this is the Kthread Freezer API stuff. This is basically just hacks in the kernel that basically checks try to freeze should we try to freeze, and then a, a whole bunch of flags like work queues and stuff that would do the same thing for them. Um, there's ways to basically remove this. This is all done in Coxinal. I basically am removing all this stuff through with Coxinal one file system at a time. Through years, it's proven to work. So I've actually manually reviewed the, the output of the, of the patches. They seem sensible. Um, but it begs the question, once we're done with file systems, should we just go AWOL and basically just remove this one subsystem at a time? Is there any concern? Are other subsystems basically using the uh, Kthread Freezer APIs in an incorrect way at this point in time? or things that perhaps we didn't think about. Remember, the Kthread Freezer API was introduced to allow file systems to stop I.O. in flight. But at this point in time, the question is, are other subsystems using it for other things that we didn't think about? I would really like someone to take a look at this kind of stuff and just possibly have some threads that we use for callbacks, for callback disclosures and stuff. And uh, I, I am not at all familiar with any of that. So I, would, I, would, I could use some, some help with that. Also, uh, well, Secret V2 does have a new freezer API. The Secret V1 one still exists, and that, as far as I understand, uses the old freezer stuff. So, uh, I mean, I don't remember what, I wasn't following it very closely. My understanding is there is a reason why they didn't want to change the old way it was done. Uh, and so that's why only Secret V2 has the new one. I suspect that if it's a question of removing everything, there will need to be the discussion about why, what, like, can we change to it? Can you compile a kernel without Secret V1? Like that you can say uh, only one secret v2 supported? I'm not sure. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. Well, the network file systems is the same as just using other things that AF has built, which does. And possibly also KNF has things coming up in DB. I, I don't know whether we in, if we're freezing those, because normally those would be on a server. Yeah, fair enough. In that case, those need some de deal with in inbound I.O. Yeah. But I I one that's already in progress, because we can can't well, maybe you can freeze, or just shut the TCP connection, if you've got a TCP connection. Oh yeah, so so uh, in the example of SMB, uh, the persistent handle. So if you took this system down and reconnected it within a reasonable amount of time, you know, within a couple of ten minutes, you might uh, the state will be preserved, so you won't lose any data. But I think the risk is you want to reject certain types of incoming requests and do reject and open. There's no point in uh, accepting any new open requests if you're about to shut down, right? Maybe. Oh well. The the one thing that kind of worries me is that when I looked at more detail none of the network file systems, even CD, this concern is not supported, right? So um, if, if we tried to freeze the file system today, there are only nine that are supported right now. Yeah, so maybe maybe really the networking file system should be handling the freeze stuff as callback and like do the stuff to shut down things. Because that's basically the notification for the file system 
So prestapass gets called when like the VFS has already blocked all the writes, blocked all the page flows for the flush, then uh, flushed all the dirty data, but and then it's time for the file system just to clean up everything as a preparation for the freezing. And you get you get unfreeze FS call when you are like returning back. So I believe these two callbacks should be used. But if, if something isn't working there for you, then like you can certainly call us back. Processes already frozen, and then it's called to freeze call, or are the processes still running? Process, do you know what they did with that for checkpoint in Spark? What they want to do? Um, that, that's that's independent. So freezing for freeze is like um, it, it's it's the same ordering problem, but but complicated by the fact that uh, user space is running out. And uh, the other thing you used to do is make um, make uh, uh, waiting for requests to be replied, making that feasible. The uh, problem with that is that uh, uh, operations call the uh, VFS block, uh, I need that for anything. And uh, so even if we make it feasible, uh, if, if if, if the operation is uh, holding something, then something might be uh, waiting on that lock, and uh, that that won't be feasible. So that would block freezing. So it's <laughs> it's a difficult issue for Queen. But it's more important than than any patch call. I mean, there's been. Ooh. <laughs> I see. Well, it's see it here. See it from an Android phone or see it from, from a Google Chromebook. If you want to freeze it for a lap even a laptop, um, a laptop typically you don't have any. Uh, you you have, I, I, I have, but most of the people on the world don't. So from priority, freeze is probably higher than manifest, but it needs to be called for me. Um, so I guess for the other subsystems, we'll just take it one at a time. Right? And for network file systems, it seems it's gonna take, take some time too. But that's why we have a flag for the super block. So if you don't want to support this for now and not sure yet, just don't add the flag. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next topic, right? So 